This is the second interview with Johan, and now we had Oscar as well. There's a table of contents in the description below. If it's not there, I'm still working on it. But I find these guys supremely interesting, not just because they are really truly making an effort to engineer this stuff and trying to get it as good as it can. They are somewhat secluded from the rest of the world. Not a lot, but Sweden doesn't quite have, they're from Sweden, Sweden doesn't quite have the same kind of access to everything that the rest of the world does. It's not so easy to get things there from China. And so some of this stuff, they are kind of reinventing themselves in the Swedish mindset. So if you know historically about Sweden, they do things in a very interesting way. It's sort of like Germany where they're very, very much engineers. And Sweden is very much like that too. Look at the things that they make and the cars they make and everything that they do. And it's really super interesting to talk to them about how they're going about doing all the things that they do and where their standpoint is, where they come from. It's particularly interesting to me because I actually come from the same mindset, except that I don't have the time or energy to dedicate to doing the research and actually finding out all the empirical information to make my things better. Anyways, here's the interview. I really hope you guys appreciate it. I do want to do more of this particular stuff. But I don't know if there's a whole lot of market or people that think on this level or care because, honestly, it doesn't really make that big of a difference to the normal, everyday pilot. But I really hope it does in the future. Take care. Hope you like it. This is Johan once again. Johan is a carbon engineer. Uh, sorry, I didn't get that. Carbon manufacturing engineer, correct? You don't actually yes. engineer the material yourself. No. But as a the fact of what you do you know a lot about the material as well and then now we also have oscar oscar is go ahead oscar. well i'm the current fa junior world champion very cool <laughs> congratulations thank you okay so johan last time we went over all of the stuff all the basics of the, with carbon um and then you left off with this is very minor it's just scratching the surface of everything you've sent me like a a nice extensive outline of things. And I don't have any immediate questions right now, except that I would tell you that the little, um, the center configuration for the TP3 frame or for just a general frame that you sent me that like we both came up with and we decided not to use because of its appearance, like a symbol <laughs> of history. It, um, I actually have it. I haven't shown you pictures. Did I, send? I may have sent you pictures of it. It works fantastic, by the way. I actually designed it into it and it's working really well. Um, it did nice yeah i'm gonna put that when i re-release it i'm gonna put that note that this came from you and go to mad quads whatever on the page anyways thanks very much for reintroducing me to that idea because it actually did work <laughs> out and i hope people don't see it as a negative first thing on your list that you wanted to discuss is vertical arm design pros and cons and how you feel about it and why everything is the way it is so you start off and i'll ask questions along the way no, it, I mean, last time we came into this discussion regarding vertical arms, and then because of some technical issues, our call was interrupted. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just want to finish this discussion regarding, yeah, the frame design. Mm -hmm. And I think it's right to take Oscar into this because it's his frame, basically. I, I technically have drawn it but it was made for Oscar it's it was his project from from start and I helped him and then I, yeah we got into this together so Oscar is his, the person that's have yeah so, so Oscar you're the this. pilot and you've done all the heaps of testing and everything on all these matters to see what works and what doesn't work right precisely so I'm the pilot and Johan's the designer and engineer so what have you found with vertical versus non-vertical versus box, all these things? Well, I came from a box frame, the Carbic Zero, which I flew last summer. And First of all, it flew where are you amazing. From? Sorry, sorry, real quick. I, I'm, I'm also from Sweden, the south okay. of Sweden. <laughs> that matters these days because you guys have a very different concept of frame design, frame everything, than people in the rest of the world. Um, if people listening are unaware, Swedish people, their designs are in my opinion, far more advanced than the rest of the world. But um, I think the rest of the world may just not be as apt to use things that are their design. Anyways, we'll discuss that later. But okay, so continue. I flew the Zero last summer, but mm -hmm. I, as I 
cr trained quite a lot, I of course crash a lot, and that meant that I broke it quite a lot. And I just sort of got tired of breaking it and repairing it. Uh, so I wanted to create something new that was that flew the same way because the zero a box frame flies amazing, mm -hmm. but I wanted more durability. And at a race, I met Johan, and he uh, introduced me to an entirely new concept in frame design, which is to focus on the material, because everyone else has used the same material. But Johan knew that there was better carbon, and he also, also had some crazy ideas for the geometry of the frame, which is now ge the geometry of the Mad S. Very cool, and you can definitely tell the geometry of the frame is it's actually pretty unique compared to most of the things out there. For the most part, 5-inch frames are very, very... There's a lot of them these days, so it's really hard to be original. This is a little bit original, but at the base of it, it is a vertical arm design. Sure, it has some original qualities to it, but at, at the end of the day, it really is vertical arms or just vertical slots versus or slats versus regular horizontal arm design. So first question I would want to ask you is, do you genuinely feel a significant difference? I already know the answer. A significant difference between vertical arm designs versus regular conventional arm designs? Yes. Okay. What are the things that you feel? It's sort of hard to describe because it's it just feels locked in. And I have some theories on why. Um, but if you do a 180 degree turn around a flag, when I, I, when I switch from a flat arm to the Carbic Zero... I kept flying into the flag because it was gripping too much. Well, I, f I thought it was gripping too much, but it's it's a good thing. It's what you want. You want grip so that you can fly tight around the flag. Why why do you feel like it might be gripping more or less? What are they? What are your theories? So, if if we imagine you're gonna do a 180 degree turn around a flag, so you're, you're turning to the right. Mm -hmm. So if you would be in a car, you would brake before the turn, but in a quad, you have no brakes. Mm -hmm. So you can only accelerate the other way. So when when you've gone past the halfway mark, that's when you actually start braking actively, because the propellers are pushing you the other way. Right. But with a vertical arm, uh, vertical arm design, you have more surface area from the side, which creates more drag from the side. So when you're when you're not straight on, you create more drag to the side so that you lose speed. So you lose speed in the direction you were originally going, which is a good thing because you don't want to keep going that way because right. then you're drifting out of the turn. Right. So there's two primary things that I personally have noticed and think that might be why these vertical arm frames may be helping or not helping, whatever they're doing, something's happening. One, thing, one theory is uh, this concept of creating just drag or just forces, lateral forces, such that it it doesn't drift because it's physically acting like a rudder. And the other concept, which is really my personal concept, is that you're rectifying the thrust coming off the disc so that it, it it's able to perform more effectively with what it's trying to do. Do any of these make sense? Yeah, both of them make sense. Uh, I, I don't think the second one has a bi as big of an effect uh, as the first one, because I don't think there's that much twisted air coming off from the propeller. Yeah. Uh, so but I, 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 I haven't looked into that. that. To the to the twisting of the air. No, I I haven't looked into it. It's just what I think currently. Okay, so what you did was you you originally flew box frame designs. You like the way they fly, and then. You decided to make a frame that was more durable so that you keep flying box frame designs, right? Yes. So there's one other issue with these vertical slats or this, this type of arm design, which I personally think is a good thing in, in racing, and that is the concept that if you're not if you're not past about 80 degrees tilt as you're flying, it's kind of causing a lot more drag than it could be. Does that make sense? Because if yeah. you look at the, the profile of the arm, it, coming down from 80 degrees, it, it's the opposite way of going past 80 degrees on a conventional arm. And so I actually think that's a great thing because you can actually break in the air. You just drop down your angle and the thing stops. 
And that's super favorable in racing, like you said, because you can slow down in speed. We don't have brakes. So it actually is useful. It makes it less, less efficient, but it is actually useful. And there's nothing efficient about racing. So I don't know if that really matters. So aside from this concept of gripping or not gripping or whatnot, that's my, that when I flew box frames, that is the reason why I like them because I actually had more control in the air of my speed as I was flying. Like it's easy to roll and pitch and do all that stuff, but actually being able to stop is very valuable or just slow down, not stop. So yeah. in reality, you're kind of flipping the scenario where a regular conventional arm, you're going past 80 degrees, then you're actually gaining all your inefficiencies. But then when you drop down below 80 degrees, and 80 degrees is really an arbitrary number, but when you drop down below that, it becomes a little bit more efficient. All that being said, the issue with box frames in general, which is why I personally think that the rest of the world hasn't really adopted them as much as Sweden in that part of the world, is because they just are complicated. They're complicated to build, complicated to service, and again, that's why you guys try to make a design that doesn't break. So then, the next question I would have is that this particular frame design, what's the weight on it? The built weight? But how do you calculate the weights? Because with, it's, the, with the hardware uh, built. Yeah, but is it including the motor screws? Because no, no, we no, no, include no. Just motor the frame. screws. Just, just the frame weight. Yeah, but uh, the motor screws is a part of our frame. The carbon, <laughs> the carbon oh, I see what you mean. Uh, yeah. Without the motors, the carbon, and just the hardware necessary to keep it together, which I understand the motors are a part of that. Uh, 72.5 grams oh, is really? what I got. That's, wow, that's not bad, actually. That's pretty good. Well, yeah, of, with all of the aluminum. That's that's actually great. So, the question then, be, oh, well, that's that's more than that's less than I was expecting. I thought it was eighty something grams. Wow, that is actually pretty impressive. Uh, most frame designs these days that are very competitive are around the sixty-five to seventy gram mark. My own latest design is right around that seventy gram marker. Uh, that's great if it's very similar in that sense as well. And so a lot of people are concerned about the weight of the frame. And um, one thing that I personally have been working on a lot is these very, very lightweight things that are very small, not five inch size. Weight matters a lot when you go down in size, a lot. But once you reach five inch, you have the potential to generate so much power that really 15, 20 grams of weight doesn't make that big of a difference, but it sort of still does. So I would ask, do you feel that the vertical arm frames are more beneficial than just dropping 20 grams of weight off a general setup? Yes, because you gain cornering performance, which okay. is, in my opinion is the most important. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter how fast you're accelerating or how fast you're on the straights, because the, yeah. the pilot is the limit. Yeah, uh, the I... pilots aren't going 100% everywhere. Yeah, but if yeah. you can cut distance in your turns and be more efficient there so that you conserve battery, then you will be faster. Look it's at so Minshan. It's it's... Just, he's just insanely fast and he's flying so crazy efficient and really tight everywhere. Yeah, but, but he's flying regular the... frames. Yeah, absolutely. But <laughs> it's it, the thing is that his flying style is what's making that better and if you have a frame that makes it easier to hold that line that's yeah it helps you uh, but he's he's not a human so he can do it with everything <laughs> <laughs> so then the next thing i would want to know is what you think about uh resonance and how that affects the flight performance and the way the flight controller actually works because that's something that i've been focusing on myself that's uh a very big thing about this Madas design and why it's uh, a frame instead of a box frame. Um, the positive thing with the box frame is that it's very stiff in pitch and roll, and I believe that is a big portion of why it's flying as good as as it does. The problem with the box frame is that it's very weak in jaw, if you, mm. yeah, between motors and gyro basically. Uh, so that is what something that we wanted to get rid of and uh, the solution is the A-frame that have triangles everywhere and everybody knows that triangles is <laughs> very stiff by yeah it but is the, very boxes, stiff. the frames that have the actual 
square box they are very stiff still like those work fine and they have a very similar esque kind of vibration profile which I'm getting to because there's a lot going on with vibration that really I've just theorized and tried to build into things but it's very different so um, the first vertical arm frame that actually did very well was the Talon from Carriera is that right do you guys remember that Yep. Yeah, I've seen the pictures. Uh, okay, you know, have, have? Yep. So uh, that I had two of them. That particular frame design, uh, which I, I wasn't really crazy about design, I think didn't think it was special at all, but I was testing my own vertical arms at that point, and I had vertical arms that were five, six millimeters thick carbon on the vertical. I couldn't even, I couldn't even fathom that there was actually vibrations transmitting through this five millimeter thick piece of carbon in the yaw direction because that's actually what was happening right you'd look at your your gyro readout and you'd see a bunch of garbage on your yaw and that's what was causing all the flight issues right something yes. like that yeah well that's that's what i found and then then i inspected the talon design and people were saying oh it flies so clean so smooth and everybody was theorizing that it's the vertical arms that are giving it this amazing property to be able to fly so well, when in reality, you actually had more stuff under the prop disc than you would if you just didn't have a vertical arm. You actually had more obstruction. And so then I started realizing that it's really that piece of carbon that ties those arms together that's just giving it the rigidity to not transmit the vibrations. And as a result, the frame has a very, very stiff structure and I think this is a side effect to what they were designing, what they were intending with the design, but that's why it flew so quote unquote clean. And so it sounded so different when people would fly it and they would say, oh, it flies amazing, it flies so nice and smooth. And I think that same effect is what happens on these box frames. I think that has a great, very significant uh, aspect of, how, of why they fly differently as well. This A-frame design has more rigidity than pretty much any design because it's not just an A-frame, it's actually a vertical, it's like it's got a third dimension of separation between the two slats, arm slats, right? Mm, kind of, yes. yeah. So everything, what we're talking about, what I'm actually talking about here is that this idea of making sure the frame is absolutely rigid or has a resonance frequency that's far beyond what the motors can even generate the idea is to avoid having that mid throttle oscillation point where the flight controller has to hammer all of the noise that's coming into it so that it can do its job and the fact that it doesn't have to deal with all that hammering and just has to screw with all the setting all the, the all the detail that's coming off the gyro to filter it down to be able to do its job means that it can actually let more information through because it knows how it's the resonance that kills everything. The motor vibrations, prop vibrations, everything else, that's not good, obviously, but that's also predictable. RPM filtering, all this stuff, those have no problems dealing with that kind of vibration. It's the resonance that really throws things off and gets crazy. At least this has been my finding. What have you thought about, done research on, looked at, Oscar? Uh, a, lot, a lot of info there. Uh, I think the main point is to be able to get lower latency, mm -hmm. which is which is bound to your filters, mm -hmm. which is dependent on your frame resonance frequency. The higher frame resonance frequency, the higher you can push your filters. Uh, because, as you said, the motor noise that is now known with RPM filters so we don't really care about that. So the other thing we can change is the frame resonance. And the higher the, it goes, the better. Because then we can use less filtering, which gives us less latency, which is just good. There's no drawback to it at all. Yeah, the, the resonance frequency was the main driving factor why we designed this frame as it is from start. The, I can take a little side story about this. Sure. That the original inspiration of this frame was actually not even drone related it was loudspeaker related because techstream as you know the material that we use uh, the company behind it are 
starting to develop uh, or helping speaker manufacturer to create speakers with Tickstream carbon fiber as their uh, membrane or diaphragm. Oh, wow. And the concept is to try to get the breakup frequency higher of the speaker than you can with aluminium and uh, titanium. Uh -huh. it, it's not as good as beryllium, but it's not even as close to that cost as beryllium. So what you're trying to do is a material that have a, a breakup that you can control in a much more sof sophisticated way than aluminium and, al and uh, titanium. Because when this happens, you get breakup all over the membrane at once. And that's what makes the sound sound distorted. Yeah, it, it sounds harsh. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah. Very interesting. But, but with carbon fiber, you because it's not isotropic, you can design it so that it breaks up in different spots of your membrane and slightly different frequencies. And by using higher modulus carbon fiber and these ultra thin uh, fabrics, you can make like a tweeter that have a breakup of 40,000 hertz. Meaning that wow. you're so you're so far <laughs> above the uh, frequency you can even hear that you cannot hear the breakup. So then what's the benefit, benefit of beryllium? It's lighter? Yeah, it's uh, lighter. The, it's a, have an even higher breakup frequency than carbon fiber. But you can you can push this as well if you go really high in in carbon fiber qualities as well or types. Wow, that's whatever. really interesting. But so that is the this is the inspiration that we used for this frame. Um, the concept is the same. What you're trying to accomplish is that you're trying to push the breakup or the resonance frequency above the motor speed. We, we're not saying that we've done it all the way, but we have definitely gone further than anybody else that we know of. Because a normal frame have a resonance about 200, 250 hertz, mm -hmm. if, if you look at like a race uh, five inch frame. Um, we have resonances around 400 and uh, slightly over 800. So if you run very limited amount of filtering it's it's super clean anyway so you can you can get away with very little filtering and still have a very clean um yeah and when you dry. add rpm filtering to it then you can pretty much turn off the filtering because it's yeah actually i have tried that today <laughs> and uh, you cannot turn it off all the way um but if you look at uh, beta flight 4.11, that is what's today when we are recording this. This is mm -hmm. the 24th of uh, November. Mm -hmm. That's the latest version right now. And if you look into the, the graphs that I showed you, sent you, you see how the MADAS looks like with uh, the gyros, gyro and um, all the filters turned to maximum with the sliders that are used in Petaflight right now. If you push them all the way to the top, and you here you can compare a normal flat arm uh, racing frame with uh, Madas, and you will see that the noise noise profile is much lower. And it is a very s similar setup, about the same tune, same hardware but different frame it's Let's not exactly go over this so this graph i've seen a lot of these kinds of graphs the colored graph with the blue and the yellow and the gradient and all that stuff that's not necessarily what we're looking at right however i can't look see at that the, 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 roll the right that, yeah like all the, right the way side, to the right all the way to the right yeah and then when you go down to the mad s it's all dropped significantly yeah especially if you look at your mm -hmm. it's that's it's the most super one. super right, stiff in your this is the same setup with the same version of Betaflight on two different calls the same day. With both are running, yeah, 
uh, RPM filter and yeah, everything is pretty much the same. So I don't think people understand the gravity of how important this stuff is because the code is very important. And what they're doing is they're just trying to apply a hammer to things so that the quad flies. But when you don't need that hammer, things fly very, very differently. I don't think many people really appreciate that. I mean, I hope they start appreciating it more and more, but it really does make a pretty significant difference. And that's what I've tried to go with with my more recent design, but my design is nowhere near uh, this level of, of detail. Like, I've just tried to get a stiffer overall structure. I'm an engineer in machines and control theory. I usually program machines and robots and stuff like that. So tuning PIDs is something that is part of my my job basically but not in in drones but they worked exact same way mm-hmm. yeah and that's why i sort of understand the problem and i tried to design a mechanical solution for a software problem basically mm-hmm. that yeah that that's what I, that's how it's always been my concept when i design things i design things to fit beta flight rather than trying to make beta flight fit what i'm doing yeah and when we started this journey we were at beta flight 3.5 somewhere Mm 3.4 and we were very limited on filter from that point as everybody know the development in beta flight has been just insanely Mm -hmm. it's so good now it's i couldn't even dream of these filters when we started this journey so then it was much more i don't know if it's less important now really don't think that it's not important anymore but it's it's not less maybe important the code is just better at dealing with a lot of stuff yeah but still if you have a better signal to start with it's always better yeah you can never get rid of that it's like video rendering the better your input the better your output exactly so what we are getting is that we can have this lower latency in our control loop because we don't need to filter so much we don't have the uh, the noise f- to start with we don't need we don't try to um, lower the amplitude by trying to soft mount something we even tried to hard mount actually <laughs> the flight controllers to, to see if that is better um, because what you're doing with uh, soft mount is just trying to lower the amplitude but you yeah. don't get rid of the frequency at, at all but mm-hmm. if you're doing something really really stiff you can actually get rid of them you can push them further up and if you're trying to filter them out at a high frequency they give you less latency and than if you compare to trying to filter them out at the lower frequency and this lower latency makes the quad fly better that's as simple as it is it's the seed that changed earlier and can I, react I to it really earlier. I really hope that low. there are under other industries that can benefit from this detail. <laughs> I think we've left the realm of normal quad things and it's just beyond what anybody really needs. I really hope that other, other industries benefit from this stuff. Yeah, and that is what we'll talk about in the next interview that we will... Because you guys are working on record. something somewhere else? Yeah, we are. Okay, so you have a lot of other stuff in here, which is just kind of things that are outside of normal carbon stuff, more material engineering stuff. Um, Oscar, do you have anything else you want to talk about or any anything else? Uh, not on this, so we just go, go ahead to the next point. <laughs> Are you sure? I mean, congratulations that you won. Wait, have you raced? Uh, Min- Sorry, I don't. I don't follow these racing things as closely anymore. But have you raced Minchan? Have you? Yes. He was. Was uh, he in the, in the in the race in this particular race? Uh, where I met him was in Russia. Uh, he he wasn't at the World Championship last year, but he will be this year. And when I raced against him in Russia, it didn't really go well for me. <laughs> He, he he's just a robot like it's it's crazy he really is crazy i don't know how this kid is able to do what he does so are you trying to catch him and beat him how hard are you working well of, of course i want to beat him like he <laughs> he's the guy to beat he's the best 
Uh, I'm I'm trying to practice a lot, uh, but the weather here in Sweden it mm -hmm. isn't that good. Uh, it's been raining uh, for a week straight now, and oh, wow. there aren't that many indoor places, so we've taken some parking garages. We haven't been kicked out yet, but uh, we might be. So instead of trying to be the absolutely best pilot, I'm trying to also get a technological advantage, having better equipment that I trust, because confidence is a really big part of it. Yeah, if I'm of confident that I can just send it, then I'm going to be faster every time. So in that same regard, it was so interesting you bring that up because you made a frame that doesn't break when you hit a, a, sorry, a cement pillar, right? <laughs> right? That was the whole point, so that you can keep going. Yes. But how many motors do you destroy? I've had pretty much the same kill rate as I had on a box frame. and Well, the, sure, my kill... in general, how many motors do you destroy? How often do you destroy motors? Um, maybe two a month. During really? the summer when I'm practicing every single day. That's amazing. But not, now, during, now during the winter, it's a bit more because well, of all the concrete. Well, yeah, that's what I meant. Like With all this concrete, you're, I'm assuming, destroying 10 times as many motors. I mean, that's some pretty harsh materials to hit. Yeah, I think I've destroyed three motors in two months flying indoor. That's amazing. Are you really just that good? You just don't crash? <laughs> no, I, I crash. I crash a lot. So I crash so much that I've gotten good at crashing. <laughs> oh, no, I, I definitely <laughs> understand that. So but actually, like Oscar is, he has like luck. He doesn't break so much stuff. I don't know really why, but it, it turned actually to be a problem when 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 we were developing this frame, because. Yeah. It doesn't break so much shaft, so you don't know what will be the, the weak point. Right. So that's exactly. so we find another guy that was actually <laughs> way better with breaking stuff. He breaks everything, including this frame. <laughs> I am so impressive to hear that because I actually haven't broken. I don't think I've broken anything in two years. I don't fly every day, but I do fly pretty often. I don't think I've broken. Anything that I have broken has been because of a failure of some sort, which I've had like three of in the air in the past two years. And I don't know if it's just because I don't push it as hard anymore or if I've just gotten good at crashing or I think it's kind of a combination of everything. But that has also significantly affected me as well because I'll make some designs and I'll send them out to some testers and they'll be like, everything broke. I'm like, how on earth did you break this thing? <laughs> I have been flying it. I mean, my frames all have four millimeter arms. I haven't broken a four millimeter arm in a year. I, I, like, how, and people are breaking six millimeter arms. Like, how on earth are you breaking a six millimeter arm on this frame? It doesn't even have the power to hit something hard enough to break a six millimeter arm. <laughs> so that is a pretty impressive thing. Anyways, I was going to ask, what do you think about using the MR30 connector for motors, which is the little three prong M M? Uh, what's it called XT30, the little XT30. It's a three-prong yeah. XT30. I... I've looked into that, and the only reason I don't use them is because I haven't found anywhere to buy them. Really? You just buy them on any from any manufacturer in China. Will get you them. <laughs> you can buy yeah, a million it, of them. It's a it's a pain to order from China. Oh, for uh, you guys. But I, yeah, the, the yeah. USA is pretty easy to communicate with China, right? Because the time zone so closer. Yeah. Yeah, it's right when I'm going to sleep. Everybody gets up and starts talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> so I was actually, I was considering making motors with the MR30 built in. And if people didn't want to use it, they could just cut it off and use like a race wire or something. Uh, I still think it's a good idea. And there are a lot of downsides to a connector for a motor because it, it is flipping frequency. Uh, like the frequency of flipping is really high. So it doesn't even have a really good connection. But the MR30, I think, is more than up to the task. I just don't know if people would be up for it. I don't know if people would adopt it or they would just think, this is clunky. I don't need the extra two and a half, two grams of weight on my quad. What's the actual benefit? What do you think about that? It, it, like, If I was to make a motor with the MR30 built into it, ready to go, same amount of time to solder up, and then if you need to switch a motor, you just unplug it and plug in another motor. And it's a predetermined length of wire on from the motor to the MR30 connector. Yeah. And then if your motor is the wrong way, you can just take out the connector, flip it, and plug it in, and the motor's spinning uh, the right way. The MR30 doesn't actually flip. It, it doesn't flip. 
So uh, I've seen a version that's similar, but that does flip. Reversible. There might be something there, but that is another concern I had because not all motors are actually wound exactly the same. And I have had motors that have had the opposite rotation on them, and that would be super annoying. Hmm. Yeah, I, I'm. I want to try it and see. I don't. I don't kill that many motors, so it wouldn't really be worth it for me anymore. Yeah. Uh, but. We had a concept in in our team uh, about a year ago to have multiple s setups, but have the main stack uh, switchable, mm -hmm. so that you could have like the, you, everything except for just the stack was switchable. So if you broke your frame, uh, like mm -hmm. completely destroyed mm -hmm. it, then you would just switch it over, right? Uh, all the electronics, and you, then you had another set of just the frame plus motors that you would slot it into. Mm -hmm. uh, but we went away from that because we designed this frame. Because it wouldn't break. <laughs> yep. uh, I, I, I've had many of the same thoughts, many of the same ideas. Tried to make like a, a plate inside the frame where, oh, I broke the quad. Okay, just take this plate off and put it on another quad that has motors screwed onto it and you're good to go. I've, and then you don't have to like change any settings or whatever. I still can't believe that Betaflight doesn't have like a, I mean, you can just do a dump and reload a dump onto the same flight controller, but there's no like really simple way to deploy your settings across multiple flight controllers, all the same thing. Like you just want to apply the same settings to everything. Instead, I have to go through and keep flipping everything up. Um, I don't know if, if um, any other flight control system has had that, has done that either. I don't know if they ever will, but okay. Interesting to hear your take on the MR30. That actually is really useful and since i'm actually moving more towards like the cinematography side like a crash you don't have time for crashes you just have like five quads with you but if you could just unplug a motor and plug another motor in if it was causing problems i mean i i would do that in, on in the middle of a job in the middle of a of a of a set that wouldn't take a lot of time if i knew yeah, it would it, work it would be absolutely perfect for that because then yeah. you don't have to worry about old motors vibrating and ruining your footage yeah, because you you could have an old set of motors for like the first try, because you, you're probably not gonna get it first try, and then you can just switch it over to brand new motors or almost brand new, when you when you know that you're you're probably gonna get it and won't crash and ruin something. So I don't think a lot of people will actually listen to this. I mean, last interview had like five six thousand people listen to it, but. I'll drop something that I've been trying to work on for the past year. So uh, when I tried the Avenger 2806.5 motors, I noticed that it was exceptionally smooth. And I think one of the factors why it's so smooth is because it has a freaking 12 millimeter bearing. I mean, that's like a skateboard bearing inside that motor. That is a massive, massive bearing. So I've actually been working on re-engineering a 2306 motor to fit the absolute largest size bearing I could possibly fit in there. Something like a 10 or 11 millimeter, I think 11 millimeter will fit. The problem is that the entire motor needs to be redesigned and re-engineered because you don't have as much length on the, on the poles. So it's, um, it's become a bit of an issue, but I'm working in that direction to just get smoother everything. Because if you fly the 2806 motor, it doesn't matter what size prop you put on it, that thing is so... I didn't, the definition of smooth, it didn't even have a definition of smooth until I flew that motor. I, people keep saying, oh, this motor is so smooth, so smooth. But I flew all these motors and they all sit, feel the same. But then when I flew that motor, it really did make a difference. Then yeah. I flew other motors that were seven inch motors that didn't have the giant bearing and it, you can absolutely feel it. So that giant bearing really does feel a lot better. A lot have better. You tried, have you tried ceramic bearings? Yeah, ceramics are way smoother, but they're not durable. They they just crumble. They crumble and then they're crunchy. It's, the crunchy bearings don't matter. They still work fine, but crunchy steel bearings actually work fine. Crunchy ceramic bearings don't work. They're not as smooth. They're not not good. But ceramic is better if you just never crash. Also, their endurance cycle is not as high. Also, they they tend to wear out. At least the ones I've tried tend to wear out. Uh, the other thing I, I had worked on was a way to swap a motor with one, one screw or one nut or something and try to come up with this mechanism of just changing the mounting base, but that didn't really work out because I couldn't get anything that was strong enough and the same weight as screws, so we're still left with screws. Uh, yeah, anyway, I don't think these kinds of frame designs and different, different options of uh, convenience are going to change a whole lot anymore moving forward. I think we've kind of reached a point where it's 
very easy and level to manage everything and our ESCs have gotten a lot more reliable lately and uh, everything's getting a lot better lately so yeah it's it's nice to reach this little stability point yeah and then comes 20 by 20 stacks and hopefully they will start actually oh, they are. hold they're great no they will there's a couple there's a couple of 20 by 20 ESCs as well as I've heard the uh, flight 1 20 by 20 which honestly I'm not a huge fan of flight 1 but at least they have some common sense when they make these things because that's really that's the first 20 by 20 ESC I've seen that's basically just a 30 by 30 ESC with 20 by 20 mounting holes which is what I've been asking for for years and for some reason nobody has bothered making everybody keeps trying to shrink the ESC we don't need it to shrink we just need the mounting holes to shrink because we don't need everything else to be 30 by 30 so it's nice to see that F1 actually took a stance and made their their ESCs like that but we are getting more and more 20 by 20 I mean I only run 20 by 20 anymore I haven't run 30 by 30 in, in a year so it's it's coming and, and all my designs only fit 20 by 20 so that's that's definitely going to be the future in that sense because you also drop a little bit of weight as well and it just works out fine okay so should we start with a little bit of the carbon material or is you have here on this list screw testing with screw testing we uh, re still regarding this frame mm -hmm. uh, when we yeah did the all the background research for this design we had to find a screw that was as good as possible um, steel is too heavy with this design because the design itself is has to be a little bit heavier mm -hmm. and you need longer screws mm -hmm. so in steel yeah it will be really really heavy so aluminum is the choice that we want to go for uh, or did go for uh, all well most other box frames or vertical arms also use aluminum for this reason so we had to try to find the best aluminum screws <laughs> and uh, we took that to uh, yeah our level of everything so we actually built our own simple test rig so that we can actually test how strong each screw were just by pulling it off basically and testing how much force it took them to, to actually break it and then started to order screws from <laughs> manufacturers <laughs> so they'd have to manufacture it for us and uh, test it uh, what we found was that to start with aluminium screws is not just one alloy just like carbon fiber there are different mm -hmm. alloys and the one we're going for is 70 75 t6 meaning that it's tempered according to a specific yeah way that takes a day or two whatever uh, and this temper makes it nearly twice as, as strong as 70 75 t0 meaning that it's not tempered uh, so that is very important so how does, problem is that to, how does it compare to titanium? It's not as strong, of course, but mm -hmm. it's not even as close as heavy as well. And uh, same way with titanium, you have to consider if it's grade 2 or if it's grade right. 5. Yeah. Uh, because you want grade 5, and that mm -hmm. is really expensive. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, anyway, we made this test rig and started testing and what we learned was that this type of screws that we're using have um they're, they're limited by first of, all, of course the material but also how the keyhole in the this um, button head screw mm -hmm. uh, how deep it actually is right because, yeah, because that's because the it weakest thins, point right, it thins out the metal at the head yeah exactly so a uh, different type of screw head is actually stronger <laughs> wow so yes so the one that we're using is not the strongest one so why don't we use the strongest one because we actually order also 70 75 uh, t6 screws with uh, the bigger head 
just to compare. But our test group that were testing this frame for us, uh, they figured out that if you if you go and get a stronger screw or even steel screws, they started breaking motors a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because then the screws were actually stronger than, than the, the base of the motor. So they ripped the, the base apart totally. Mm -hmm. So they actually preferred the this screw that is absolutely not weak in any way. It takes it takes over two hundred kilos. I think it's two hundred and thirty kilos to break it. Yeah, so you, you just engineer the screw so that it breaks instead of the applicator. Well, I mean, no matter what if you crash, something's gonna break. Yeah, yes. and we think that the screws are cheaper than motors, so that's why we actually are going for this. If somebody wants to order our frame with the other screws that are stronger, that's no extra cost. They can just say to us that oh, we want that screw and they get it for the same price. We have it in stock, but um, so far nobody really wants it, <laughs> and I think there is a good reason for that. So then let's talk about what's S-Glass? Carbon fiber. Oh, fiber. is that fiberglass? No, it's actually glass. Why but I think that we should sum this up right now. Okay. And then okay. we can uh, take this in the next video. Okay, that's good. Stay because we have that's so good. much Yeah, we have so much to talk about in the next video about carbon fiber. Okay. We're going to get, this is get fantastic. Uh, this digging is, deep. This is great. I, I'm going to put a little disclaimer at the beginning of this so that people understand. I mean, I mean, this stuff is things that I don't think people normally think about. It's, I mean, it's nice to talk to you guys and talk about it because, I mean, I feel like I can sort of understand most of it, but I don't think most people think about this stuff a lot. So it's going to be interesting to see what people say about it and what they think. Yeah, I want them 